السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. هو الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم. هو الله هو الذي لا إله إلا هو المالك القدوس السلام من المحيم العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله أما يشركون. هو الله الخالق الباري المصبر. له الأسماء والحسنى يسبه له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم. Dear brothers and sisters, I welcome you to this discussion on the spirituality of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Before I go any further, I want to thank these young uh, students from the class of the Masjid. Mashallah, their, their recitation of the Quran and, and the love with which they recited the Nasheed were really heartwarming. It's also good to see so many of you here. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is the third time we are doing this. Uh, and uh, it is good to see that more and more people are beginning to appreciate this. The three ayahs that I just recited, uh, I hope this speaks it up. The, the, yeah. Are we like a bit here for right? Yeah, it's right. So the three ayahs that I just recited, Chapter 59, it's very interesting, I like this ayah, and they are very special because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these ayahs is doing several things. Number one, he is also taking the shahari. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran, So there are many places in the Quran where we see the Quran itself, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word, uttering the shahari, and there is no Allah or no God worthy of our worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is interesting is that in these three concentrated verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is embarking on a journey of self-disclosure. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing to us many of his attributes, many of his characteristics, many of the elements of his nature. And that is very important for us to do because one of the ways in which we understand God's creation is that God's creation is a continuous tajalli, which means it is a continuous manifestation of the divine attributes of God. So when you watch the creation, when you watch... There's no battery, 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 battery which is changing. It's it's battery. Battery. Okay. Yeah, it is so fragile, battery. Yeah, it felt that it was choking me anyway. <laughs> so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we look at this creation, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously indulging in an exercise of self-disclosure. He is telling us more and more about himself. So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a concentrated few verses, reveals so many of his names, so many of his attributes. And he also says that, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, that everything that God has created, everything that exists in this creation, praises Him. So there is no question that there is anything that denies the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is very emphatic, there is no doubt about it. So philosophically and metaphysically, everything that exists has submitted to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that exists in the heavens and the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reach us? How does he communicate with his creation? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us? And today we have got together, all of us, to talk about that. Today we are here to not only remember, praise and learn, but also celebrate the life of Prophet Muhammad The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is perhaps in Muslim theology the greatest of God's creations. Khairul Bari, he is the best of all that has been created. But he is more than that. We live in a world which is modern, and one of the characteristics of this modern world is cynicism. So when we become cynical, when our fitrah when our heart, when our outlook, when our world will become cynical, then it is suspicious of everything that claims to be real. 
It is suspicious of anything that claims to be spiritual and pious. It is that state of cynicism which has compelled even Muslim traditions to, God forgive us, diminish the stature of our dear Prophet By just thinking of him as just a human being who is a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today I want to remind us that he is much more than that. Today I am not going to talk to you about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the lawgiver or just the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or one who taught us how to govern. But today I am going to talk to you inshallah with the help and the permission of Allah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a cosmic bridge between the Creator and the creation. Prophet is that bridge. He is like a dual wall. You know what a wall is like? Like a portal. It is a portal which connects us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah speaks to us through him. The Quran is revealed to Prophet Muhammad Then there are other messages that also come to us through our dear Prophet. The Wahi is not limited just to the Quran. A lot of things that the Prophet ﷺ taught to us, which we find in the collection of Ahadith and his Sunnah, are also divine messages that have come to us through the Prophet. And we also try to reach him, to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the help of the Prophet Muhammad. And that is why sometimes affectionately he is also known as Shafi. Shafi Allah as one who will seek intercession on our behalf on the Day of Judgment in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that is an important part to understand. Now all of us, we forget, we are so caught up in the mundane realities of life, in the pursuit of material well-being and pursuit of material comfort, that we forget the spiritual aspects of our life. And the most important aspect of that spirituality is our very own nature as individuals. We are both temporal and eternal. Which means that if you look at every human being, there is a part of us that will die. That is our body, which we will bury here. But there is a part of us which is eternal, which will never die. And depending on where you end up, hell or heaven, etc., you have an eternal life, a life after this life. Those who become ghafil, those who become indifferent to their connection to the divine, focus on the material aspect of our existence and the material nature of our constituency, of what we are made of. And that's where we get lost. Because that which we fall in love with, that which we pursue, is going to die. And we forget to nurture that part of us which is eternal. And that is an important part. And that is what I want to address today when I talk about the spiritual connection of Prophet Muhammad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما. Now this ayah is is I'm very widely known. You hear it all the time in the khutbahs. You must have heard it several times today. Uh, it is it, it is a very profound honoring of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in the Quran. No nothing is honored so gloriously in the Quran. Other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is through this ayah. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that indeed Allah and His angels. Indeed Allah and His angels. Now, the word Yusalu is so difficult to understand. I was reading some commentators, and those commentators were totally flummoxed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's use of this word. If literally it would translate that indeed Allah and His angels. Pray upon the Prophet. Because it is a conjugation of Salah, Sandu. 
What does it mean? I mean? What does it mean that even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prays upon His Prophet? What does it mean? When you and I worship Allah, we worship Allah. When you and I send Dalud and we send blessings upon Prophet Sallallahu we are sending these blessings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the Prophet, bless the Prophet Sallallahu and bless his family and bless his companions and bless all those who care about him. But what does Allah himself mean when he says that he himself says, he himself sends blessings upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is nothing that is so glorified in the entire creation that even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends blessings. There is only one thing or one entity or one person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself along with all his angels sends mercy upon and that is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when you hear this verse, I mean you should be in the appropriate awe of the meaning of this verse. It is not a small statement, it is a very powerful statement honoring Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whose name Muhammad means the much praised one and this ayah is proof as to how much he has been praised. But this ayah has since then become the source of an entire tradition among Muslims to praise and send blessings and send barakah on Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala siyyidna wa ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallayka ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa ala Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama barak ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim All of you who can pray notice. And every time you pray, you send salawat on the Prophet as part of the prayer. You know, people say that why should we celebrate Mawlid and why do you celebrate Mawlid on one day? Let me tell you, we celebrate Mawlid in every salah. We celebrate Mawlid in every <coughs> salah. When we recite the Durud Ibrahim, you are celebrating Mawlid. Because the whole purpose of Mawlid is to praise, send blessings, and peace upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that is very important for us to understand that, that even in prayers we are sending prayers. So it is a prayer inside a prayer. It is a prayer inside a prayer. While we stand up in salah and while we are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are also sending blessings to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in our salah. That is something none of us should ever forget. That if you pray five times a day, subhanallah you are celebrating Mawlid five times a day because that is what it is all about. But this tradition has also given birth to a lot of interesting things such as people, scholars, poets, etc. started writing their own salawat. Salawat is the Arabic word for what people in Urdu would say dulut. Whatever you recite in the prayers of Prophet whatever you recite in such a way that there are blessings that are being sent upon him, it is a durud or it is a sarawah. I'm going to pick two people that I'm currently studying and I like them a lot, whose personal sarawahs I'm going to recite to you now. Uh, this one is by a very important Andalusian scholar, Ibn Arabi. His sarawah goes like this. La ilaha illa anta ya ahadu ya samadu La ilaha illa anta bi al wujud wa laka sujud wa anta al haq al ma'bud Allahumma auzibika minni wa as'aluka zawali anni Allahumma wa tawassalu alayka bil wasilatil uzna wa fadilatil kubar wa habibul adna al walibul mawala Muhammad al Mustafa Safir Murtada wa Nabiul Mushtaba Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to read the translation and listen very carefully. It is so profound. He does just two or three sentences if not already captures so much about the nature of God, the nature of Prophet Muhammad and the connection between the two of them. He says, 
in the first part that I recite, there is no God save you. So he's taking Shahada right away. He starts by saying, La ilaha illa anta. There is no God by save you, O one, O eternal and absolute. There is no God save you. Existence is by you, for you is sajda or prostration, and you are the worshipped truth. You are the worship truth. O oh Lord, I seek refuge with you from me. Now this is a very profound thing. I am seeking refuge in you. People normally seek refuge from vasvasas, from shayateen, from other misguided men. But in this, Ibn Arabi is saying that he is seeking refuge in Allah from himself. I seek refuge in you from me and I beseech you that I am freed from myself. And I pray to you, Allah, that you free me. It doesn't mean that he is praying to die. <coughs> but he is praying to die in a mystical way, in a spiritual way. He is seeking fana, fill Allah. So he wants to submit himself in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, O oh Lord, and I appeal to you by the greatest means. And this is what he used. He uses his face. Bil wasiyatil uzma, the greatest means and the grandest virtue and the closest loved one and the supported ally Muhammad the Chosen, the accepted friend, the selected Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here he's telling you the relationship between Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and God. He says, as far as Prophet Muhammad is concerned, he is God's supported ally. He is God's chosen one. He is the one who is an accepted friend, which means that we try, all of us are reaching out to Allah to make him our friend. You all want to be Wali of Allah. But there are some that Allah has accepted as his friend. Ibrahim called him Wali of Allah as a friend. And he took Prophet Muhammad as an accepted friend. And he also picked of him as selected prophet. Even the Quran says that all prophets are the same. We do know that when it was time for Mirad, it was the Prophet who was Imam al Anbiya. He was the one who was leading the prayer with all the prophets in the congregation. I want to share with you a very beautiful poem from Maulana Rumi. Unfortunately, I have both the Persian translation as well as the English, the Persian original and English translation of the poem. But I never heard the poem in Persian being read. And unfortunately, in the last two days, at least, I couldn't find the audio. And I don't trust my Persian pronunciation, so I will not read it. If I read it in Persian, I probably will kick, kill it. Mawana Rumi might be tempted to come out of his grave and slap me in front of all of you. So I will not take the risk. So I'm going to just read the translation. But what is important is what he's talking about. The poem in itself is very beautiful. For those of you who understand and appreciate Persian poetry, you should find it and read it. He says, I bring blessings upon you, O Muhammad, so that the breeze of nearness to God may increase. In just one sentence and he said, I mean, there's nothing more left to say beyond that. He says, I bring blessings upon you, O Muhammad, so that the breeze of nearness to God may increase. So you can get the smell of God, you can get the touch of God, the sense and flavor, the fervor of God by sending blessings to Prophet Muhammad. Since with nearness of the whole, all parts are allowed to approach. That is a very philosophical state. If the wind had taken me to you, I would have held tight to the skirts of the wind. I miss you so much that I would fly to you faster than a bird. But how can a bird with a clip wing fly? So here he is talking about his desire to connect with God. His desire to reach and become one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have a communion with the divine. But he's unable to do this. Human beings are limited. Our capacity to communicate and communion with God are limited. He's saying we are like birds with, whose wings have been clipped so we cannot fly. So how can I fly to you? If I could fly to you, O oh Lord, I would fly to you. And obviously you know where he's going with us. And so he says, the wailing pole was crying and moaning. What he means to say is that the Prophet and my love for Prophet are the wings with which I will fly to you. In case you missed it, he's saying that I would love to come to you, my Lord, I would love to fly to you, but I cannot. 
And the only way I can fly to you is through my love for Prophet Muhammad which will serve as the wings that will take me towards you, O oh my Lord. And he concludes it by saying, the wailing Paul was crying and moaning like people with intelligence because of separation of the Prophet. He's saying that the wailing Paul, he said, Paul, I tell you about the Paul, was crying and moaning like people with intelligence because of separation from the Prophet. The Prophet asked, Hey Paul, what do you want? And the Paul replied, My blood has frozen from separation. My blood has frozen from separation. You were leaning on me, but now you left me and have mounted the pulpit. If Mustafa does not make a path in our hearts, does not exist in our hearts, and does not lean on our hearts, it is natural that we mourn and turn into a wailing poem. So what he's saying is that, O oh God, oh Pro God, if Prophet Muhammad does not come near me, then we will be like a pole that is mourning. I don't know whether you know this story, it is in some other hadith literature, that in the beginning when the Prophet Prophet's mosque was being constructed, was not yet ready, he used to lean on a palm tree. It, was, it is part of the structure of the mosque. Later on it is said that the mosque is built in such a way that the palm tree is part, is like a natural support of the roof of the mosque. So the Prophet while giving the khutbahs and his lectures would lean on the tree and he would recite the Quran and he would lecture. But as the mosque construction went ahead and the pulpit was built for him, remember, he left the tree and he started giving the khutbah. And everybody in the audience, and there are many such traditions which testify to this, they actually say that they heard the tree cry. This tree started moaning and sighing while the Prophet was on the pulpit and giving the sermon. And the poor, it just kept moaning. So he stopped, he came down and put both his hands on the tree. Prophet Sallallahu put both his hands on the tree and consoled it until it stopped crying. And it's obvious, I mean, this, there are hundreds and hundreds of poems. For those of you who are from Pakistan, there is a lot of Sindhi poetry and music and khawali about this. You can find it and enjoy it. But the point that he's trying to make is that the Paul understood the spiritual value of proximity and nearness to Prophet Muhammad he could not bear this distance. He could not bear the distance. It was not what he was sighing and crying. And that is what Rumi is saying when he says that I am sighing and crying because I want to be near God. I want to fly to God, but I don't have the wings to fly to God. And Ya Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are my wings. I need you to fly. I need you to take me to that point where I will be in touch with my lover with my beloved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is an important part. Without the Prophet sallallahu there is no connection. That is why when we take the shahada, both the names are connected. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. You have to join both the names before you can take shahada and testify. There are many people who have written, one of them is very popular, well-known one, you know this. Ya Nabi Salaam Alaika, Ya Rasul Salaam Alaika, Ya Habib Salaam Alaika, Salaamatullahu Alaika. O Prophet, peace be upon you, O Messenger, peace be upon you, O Beloved, be peace upon you, the prayers of Allah be upon you. Anta Nurullahi Fadran Jita Ba'ada Usra Yusra, Rabbuna Alaka Qadran Ya Imam Al-Anbiya. You are the light of Allah at dawn. You came after the hardship as convenience. Our Allah raised up your position, our Imam, leader of the Prophets. Anta fal lajdani hayyun, anta lil aynayni layyun, anta indal hamdi rayyun, anta adil wa safiyun, ya Habib, ya Muhammad. You are alive in our hearts and sentiment. You are the light of our eyes. You are the irrigation of the hearts. You are the absolutely pure guide, my beloved Muhammad. Ya Nabi, salam alayka, ya Rasul, salam alayka. Ya Habib, salam alayka, salawatullahu alayka. Before I go further, there have been some requests from Oh, before that I want to share a secret with all of you. This is a 
secret from the great Sufi that I learned. And he made me do a lot of, pay a lot of homage to him before he told me. He told me that modern cell phones have buttons by which you can put them on vibrant. So in meetings and prayers, etc., tone it down and put it on off. That is the secret. But one of the things that people told me before he started his lecture to address the religiosity and the authenticity was celebrating Maulid. Maulid is a celebration of the birth of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu A lot of people say that it is a bidah, that it is something that is forbidden. Some people have even gone to the extent as to call it haram. The first thing that you must understand is that, yes, it's a practice that started maybe four to six hundred years after the Prophet Sallallahu death. But there is a lot of ikhtilaf among scholars about its authenticity and its validity, whether it is permissive or not. So there is no consensus among all scholars whether this is allowed or not. That's the first thing that you need to understand, that it is, there are many scholars who feel, for example, Yusuf Kharabawi from among contemporary scholars has said that it is okay and permissible and even beneficial to celebrate Maulid as long as you do not indulge in crazy activities. Because some places people may do strange things. I saw some YouTube videos about how Maulid is celebrated in some parts of the world and I find it totally bizarre. I can't relate to it. Imagine letting a horse loose on Route 14 and people running behind it and chasing. No, that's not how we would like to celebrate Maulid. That's not how we would like to remember Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there are also people who do weird things on the Eid, at the end of Ramadan. Some people even, God forgive them and us, indulge in drinking in alcohol, but that does not mean just because some Muslims have had alcohol on Eid, we ban Eid itself. We don't do that. So that is an important part to understand. But let me address the argument itself. The argument stands on two pillars. One of his pillars is from the Quran, which is in Surah Maida, al yom akmal tu dinukum, this part of the whole ayah. Today I have completed your religion, my religion for you. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, al, al yom akmal tu lakum dinukum wa atamtum alaykum ni'mati wa radaytu lakum al islam adin. What it really, from this day I have perfected for you your religion, completed my favor upon you, and I'll prove you for your Islam as religion. So people argue that today this, according to Azbal Nuzul, of when this ayah was revealed, this ayah was revealed on the Friday of the last Hajj that the Prophet Muhammad was performed. So the argument is that on that day the religion of Islam has been completed. And therefore, anything that is added to the practice of Islam subsequently is a bidah or an innovation. And they rely on another tradition which says, Kullu bidah kalala, kullu kalala. Now, every innovation is misguidance, and every misguidance will lead to fire. So, anything that is done after the revelation of this ayah is a bidah in every bidah. But there is a problem with this argument. The problem with this argument is that the interpretation is wrong. For example, if indeed that ayah means what people say, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed his religion on that day, then that should be the last revelation, isn't it? There cannot be any other revelation after that with at least legal implications. There can't be any sharia ayah coming, ayah of ahkam coming after the revelation of this ayah, because if it did, then it counters the idea that religion was perfected already and now there are new rules coming. So if you go and look up as to which are the last ayah, you find that there is no consensus among the scholars or even among the Sahaba as to which was the last ayah of the Quran. There are many ayahs. In fact, Ibn Abbas anhu himself identifies three different verses as the last ayah in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. And I'll tell you which ones they are. In Surah Baqarah, verse 278, 281, 282, in Surah Tawbah, verse 128, in Surah Nisa, 176, verse 93, all of these are supposed to be the final words of the Quran. So we have many traditions, so we really don't know which is the last time. But what is interesting about 282, 
in Surah Al-Baqarah, besides the fact that it is also the longest ayah in the Quran, is it has specific legal statements about usury and loan and debt, also about witnesses, about women, how many women should be involved in witnesses. So it's a very clearly ayah of ahkam. So this idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had completed the religion and anything after this verse is done is not. That is one point that I would like to make. The second thing is that people argue about this, this whole idea of kullu billah. Problem is that there are many practices that some of the companions of the Prophet started after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi so when people actually operationalize this and you, they get into these debates about whether Maulid is valid or not, they will ask you the same question. Did the Prophet celebrate Maulid? No. Did his companions celebrate Maulid? No. So it is a way. So it is an innovation and therefore it is a way. Fine. But the problem is that the Prophet also did not pray Tarabi 20 rakats. We know that. It's a very famous counter example that everybody cites. And it's a, counter, it's a very interesting counter example because in the hadith, uh, Azad Umar specifically uses the word bid'ah hasana. What an excellent bid'ah this is. Very strongly approving. So there are many scholars, including Imam Nabawi, who have talked about the meaning of what is a good innovation. So this idea that every innovation is bad is mistaken. The first time I heard this is. In Qadib in the U.S. talking about this Kullu Bidar Dalala, Kullu Dalala. I was at Georgetown University and the room was very small and I just fell down laughing. I was just sitting and I just rolled over laughing because it was so funny to me. And the Qadib was very upset with me and came and said, what happened after this? I thought you were standing and giving a khutbah in English and telling me that every Bidar his misguidance and every misguidance would lead to fire. I just wanted to know when Prophet Sallallahu or any of the companions gave the put by in English. If according to your definition, the Veda is something that Prophet Sallallahu has not done and his companions have not done, and you're giving this lecture in English, it doesn't make sense to me. To me, it's, a bit, it's an innovation. Giving lectures in English are an innovation. The three azans that you have inside is including the Khama. The first azan, the second azan, and the akhama. The first azan is when people come to the mosque, the second one is when the khatib stands up, and then the akhama when they start the prayer. It never happened like that during the time of Abu Bakr or Umar. It started at the time of Umar. That's another innovation. The collection of the Quran. The Quran was not collected in the life of Prophet. So, what happens is, philosophically speaking, you are arguing that there are two sharias. One Sharia for the Sahaba and one Sharia for the rest of us. It is okay for the Sahaba to innovate, but it is not okay for us to innovate. Which obviously no one will accept it. We reject it. But nevertheless, we have accepted a lot of innovations if and after the Sahaba. For example, translation of the Quran. Not just writing in Arabic, but translating it into different languages. It was never done. Even in the time of the early Sahaba, the translations came much later. Is it that a bit? I have here one of the latest, this is one of the most brilliant and latest work that came out. It is both a translation and a kind of commentary. I think you should all take a look at it. Isn't that the mirror? The whole idea of jurisprudence, the establishment of Madahib, which Sahabi was Hanafi and which Sahabi was Shafi, can you tell me? No. All of these are innovations which came later to Hanafi, Shafi, etc. etc. There is a long list, I can go on and on and on. <coughs> innovations, the religious innovations. Having two jummas in the same city, having two jummas in the same mosque, the same imam giving two jummas. These are all Vedas. The Prophet never gave two khutbahs in the same mosque on the same day. Neither did any Sahaba. Going and breaking his star with a Jew in his house. A lot of us did in this room. A lot of people who couldn't come were upset. And I was sitting there and telling people, isn't this a bidah? <coughs> so how do we reconcile this? First, let me tell you that the Prophet ﷺ did commemorate his birthday. The Prophet ﷺ is to fast every Monday. Do you know that? He fasted every Monday. 
And one day, one companion came and asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why do you fast every Monday? And he said, only one thing, because that is the day I was born. That is the day I was born. Prophet ﷺ was born on Monday, he was conscious of it, and he commemorated it. I am so sorry that he didn't put up a candle and cut a cake for people here to understand that he was celebrating his birthday. But fasting was his way of commemorating and recognizing the fact that this day is important that I was born on that day. And his way of expressing the importance was to do something that would bring him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why lots of Muslims do fast on Mondays. And at least on this day, when we at least have a form of milad, you ought to have. That is an important part of it. This, this ayah 5.3, I will tell you later, it happened to me, in fact, while preparing for this lecture, I, I came across a completely different uh, interpretation of that part of this ayah. And it blew my mind, and I think uh, I feel extremely grateful for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for introducing me to that alternate interpretation. If you actually look at the entire third ayah, Surah Maida, which is revealed after the fifth ayah, the fifth ayah basically says that we can eat the meat of Ahl Kitab, but it then qualifies it by saying that you can't eat uh, the lamb of Kanzir. So it is perfecting, I think, the law of eating. It is about eating there, but there is something more to it. That is one thing. But the second part of innovation it, it, that doesn't stand on it, they are more. But if you read the first tafsir of the Quran, which is by Ibn Abbas, if you actually, if you go to altafsir.com, if you can, this, I, I don't know whether there is an English translation of Ibn Abbas's tafsir, but Dharmic is there. If you just go and look at the third verse, he says very clearly in writing this tafsir that yes, the meat of of the khanzir is prohibited. But if there is nothing else available, you can still eat it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. Now what it does is that this ayah also establishes the principle of darura in Islamic law. Islamic law has many sources, the Quran, the Hadith, the Sunnah, Ishtihad of scholars, the Ijma of the Sahaba, the Ijma of the Ummah, for the Maliki, the Sunnah of the people of Medina, the Maslaha, Maslaha, Mursala, Uf, the custom of the people, all of these are sources of Islamic Sharia. But Darura or necessity is also a source of Islamic law. And so you can make laws on the basis of it. So the reason why I feel the need to celebrate Mawlid is because I feel it's necessary for us. We live in an age of Islamophobia. And one of the biggest targets of Islamophobia is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu <coughs> People drawing his images, drawing his cartoons. The internet is full. The internet is full of foul stuff that is so in this age when the Prophet is the target of hate, it is important for us to respond, not respond to these things by violence, but to respond by praising the glory of the Prophet even more than we used to normally. It is important that we have Maldiv every week, every month, every, every day if possible. That's the best way that you counter. Let the world know how important he is, how dear he is to you, how central he is to the faith of Islam. And that is one important, it is our darura today. But, but the kind of mawlid I have in mind is not a mawlid which involves us getting intoxicated in music or intoxicated in poetry and become lost from who we are. No, I want a knowledge driven mawlid where people are informed about who the Prophet really is, and most importantly, our next generation and our old self. How many of us know how great a human being was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You'll take a lifetime to read his biography in the Ahadis. 
and then understand them, and then internalize them. So I think it is very important, it is absolutely necessary for us. When I was reading the history of Maulid, I realized that Maulid started in those societies which were multi-religious, multi-Christian, Egypt, Syria, some parts of Iraq. And what was interesting was that there were a lot of Christian minorities, or in some places, of equal strength. And they celebrated Christmas in a very grand fashion. And as a result of the grand celebration of Christmas, young Muslims used to join in the celebration of Christmas, and it freaked some of the ulama out. And as a response to this, they, they started celebrating Maulid, and said, okay, let Christians celebrate, and we will celebrate. So in a way, it was a response to the similar circumstances that we are here. I ran into a very good friend and brother, fellow brother a couple of days ago, and I asked him, are you coming here today? For this? And he immediately gave me the standard argument about how this is a bit, uh, and he doesn't even want to celebrate Christmas. So he's not coming here because this is a bit, uh, he doesn't want to come to the Juma tomorrow, where I'm going to celebrate the double Mawlid, the Prophet Sallallahu as well as Isa ibn Maryam, the birthdays. First time in 400 years that the two birthdays have coincided. And he said, Christmas is a pagan stuff, etc. But the funny part was, as we departed, I said, we haven't met for a long time. When was the last time we met? And the last time we had met was at a Diwali celebration. So, that is a pagan festival in some way, but it's okay to celebrate Wali, but not Eid and Nabi. It's okay to celebrate Pakistan Day and Jinnah Day. In Turkey and Egypt, people are obsessed with date. The latest university in Turkey is called May 29th. Isn't it? May 29th University in Uskudat. used to be Istanbul before. Of course, May 29th is the day when Istanbul was conquered, and that's why they're celebrating. But that is a celebration of a specific day. In Egypt, they have cities named after October something. I don't remember the word. They have a bridge called October something, on the day that, that Anwar Sadat had successfully crossed the cities, and so on and so forth. So Muslims celebrate all kinds of things, but when it comes to the Prophet Sallallahu birthday, Kundubi Dalala. Wow. It is kind of, I don't understand what the whole point is really, you know. Especially these days when people are professionally paid to... We have professional Muslims whose job is Islam. There no Sahaba or the Prophet Sallallahu job was Islam. What is your career? I am a career in Islam. That's what I do. That's what I get paid for. So, it is, so having said all of that, I think it is very important for us. For our spiritual purpose. So, Coming back to this idea of Prophet as something great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi We have sent you as nothing but mercy to humanity. Now this is something we have to see. One of the styles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is very peculiar. Human beings don't talk like this. Like for example, when we articulate our shahada, we say, La ilaha illallah. Then you say, you say first, La ilaha, there is no God except Allah. So what happens is, uh, in, a, in a Hegelian sense, when you say there is no God, we are absolutely free. There is no state, so we are free from citizenship and national loyalties, and there is no God, we are absolutely free. In that state of absolute freedom, we assert our submission to Allah SWT. So, la ilaha illallah. If it was said in just a positive sense by saying there is only one God, it doesn't have the same philosophical, same mystical, and same spiritual impact as to say there is no God except Allah. There is nobody worship, worthy of worship except Allah. So, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the same sign when He said, Brahma al sallaka illa Muhammad. I have not sent you Muhammad as anything. I have not sent you as conquerors. I have not sent you as this, that, whatever Muslims might think. I have sent you only as mercy to humanity. And if Muslims or anybody else sees it as anything other than mercy to humanity, there is a problem. We are in violation of Allah Ta'ala's command as to why he sent Prophet Muhammad sallallahu This is very important for us to do, especially in this age when people think that he was sent here to do war or establish jihad or establish Islamic law and push it down your throat whether you like it or not. This is very important. 
He was sent as nothing as a message to Allah. One day a man came to meet Prophet Allah. He was in a hurry, he had to go very far, he had to travel very far, and he wanted to conduct some business. And as he was walking with the Prophet, a child fell off and he was crying. And the Prophet Muhammad stopped to console the child. And while he's consoling the child, this man is getting irritated and he's, he's, he's in a hurry, he wants to go. So he's, he does something or he says something by which he communicates his you know, impatience to Prophet. And the Prophet turns to him and says, Allah will not show mercy to those who do not show mercy to other human beings. Oh, that must have chilled his heart. And that is an important part. It is about compassion. Every day in his interactions with his family, with his companion. I read in a tradition that when his daughter Fatima used to come, the Prophet used to stand up. When his daughter entered the room, he would stand up out of respect for his daughter. The way his relationship with Khadija, all of these are full of compassion. They have operationalized this concept of compassion. It is easy to say merciful, but we don't know how to be merciful. And in order to know how to be merciful, you have to, to learn that from Prophet Muhammad. <coughs> for me, this day is very special because I have a daughter, and she was also born on 12th Rabi level. So to me, it's like this very beautiful connection special connection uh, to this day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Indeed, I have sent you as a great moral character. Now remember all the attributes that I'm talking about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially from the Quran because it has a very significant meaning. At the end of it, I put it all together inshallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we indeed I have sent you as a perfect moral character. In the tradition, the Prophet said, there is something special about every Ummah. And every Prophet, while they have the same teachings, they have a special, special message. For example, the special message of the Prophet of Isa brought was of love. When somebody asked, uh, Jesus about the Ten Commandments. He said the Ten Commandments can be summarized into these two commandments, which is love thy God and love thy neighbor. It just reduced the whole of Ten Commandments to love. The Prophet said, the speciality of my Ummah is Haya. It is the opposite of shameless. The opposite of shameless too. I don't know how to, what word to use in English. It is interesting that I can't find a synonym for haya in English. But he also said, and I had a special mission which is to perfect the moral character of my ummah. It is to perfect the moral character of my ummah. It is very important in our interaction with others. We come up as people with high moral character. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wa innaka la Allah khuluq razim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya ayyuh nabi inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadiran. Indeed, we have sent you, O Prophet, as a witness and a bringer of good tidings and a warner. So he's here to give us good news that there is a God who loves us and there is life after life. Etc. But he's also warning us that there is a day of judgment. But also something interesting. He's a witness. He's a witness to what? What is the Prophet in this world a witness to? What is he witnessing? What is he testifying to? Just the fact that there is a God? No, there is much more. Bearing witness doesn't mean to just utter it from your mouth. When you say, when you take shahada, it is not about just saying la ilaha illallah, you have to live it. It is when you live according to Islamic values, when you live according to God's principles, that's when you are doing shahada. Every act, when it is acted upon to please Allah, to seek Allah's pleasure, only then is that an act of shahada. So what is the Prophet witnessing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَدَعِمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِإِذْنِهِ وَسِرَاجَ الْمُنِينَ and he is one who invites to Allah by his permission as an illuminated lamp. So he uses the analogy of Siraj al-Mudir when he's talking 
about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that he is Sirat al he is the Lamb. Well, this is something very, very fascinating. Uh, I want to read to you another durood that somebody wrote. I wish I could find out who it was in this durood about light. In many ways, the Prophet has been equated to light. And not just in Sirat al Muniran, but elsewhere also, he has been treated as light. And I, wish, I, have, I hope I have not lost the page. Oh, here it is. In which the, there is a do. Yes, uh, these are the ayahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ja'akum min Allah nurun wa kitabun mubeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent you a light and a clear book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ja'akum min Allah nurun wa kitabun mubeen. And there has come to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a light and a clear book. Yahdi bihi Allah man ittaba'a ridwanu. And Allah guides those who pursue the pleasure of God by this book and by this light. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here saying something like, And He is the one who extracts you from ignorance and brings you into enlightenment. This is the role of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He has been sent as a light with a book to extract us from darkness and bring us into enlightenment. This is amazing. I mean, this is, what does enlightenment mean? What does enlightenment mean? I mean, if you take this verse seriously, if you are a true follower of Prophet Muhammad, you cannot be unenlightened. You cannot be unenlightened. Because the purpose of which he sent Prophet Muhammad <laughs> by his permission, by the permission of Allah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu will extract us from darkness and bring us into <coughs> enlightenment. And this is the proof that somebody wrote, I wish I knew who did this. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad nur al-anwar wa sir al-asrar wa sayyid al -abrar. Now what this means is fascinating. He said, O oh Allah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina, O oh Allah, shower thy blessings on our master Muhammad. Nur al-anwar. The light of enlightenment. See, this is how he's describing Nur al Anwar. The light of enlightenment is Prophet Muhammad. It is through his light, Siraj al Munir. It is through his light that we develop those values, those comprehensions, that refined reason, that defined, refined mannerism, that refined perception of reality, that interaction, that compassionate society which can be called as enlightenment. It is the light of Prophet Muhammad which created Nur al-Anwar was Sir al-Asral, the mystery of the mysteries. He is the mystery of the mysteries and the leader of excellence, Sayyid al that he is, a, he is the leader of all those people who have Abra or those who have achieved their who achieved excellence, who are salihin, who are boxingin, and he is the leader of all of those who have reached that. So what, where are we going with this whole idea? What does it mean that the Prophet is the light of enlightenment? And to understand that, you have to understand a concept called insan al kamil In South Asia, there was a philosopher slash poet called Iqbal. Iqbal was very profound, very modern, at the same time very philosophical and sometimes very mystical. I'm trying to find a poem by him which is very important. I want to read it to you because some of you might understand it and may already know it. Now Iqbal was dealing with a situation where he was acutely conscious of the decline of the Islamic civilization. He was acutely conscious of the declining power of Muslim society. He was aware of Europe. He had traveled and studied in Germany. And he was also deeply motivated to revive Islam and Muslim societies. So he says in one of his poems, he says, कौन अंदाज़ा कर सकता है इसके ज़ोरे बाज़ू का निगाह मर्द मोमिन से बदल जाती हैं तकलीफ़ 
<coughs> this is a very famous Ross poet. What he's trying to say is that who can estimate the power or the strength of the arm? Who can estimate the power of the hand of the arm of this mother woman or this perfect man? Whose one glance can change the futures. Whose one glance can change the future. So this is an important concept. So he takes this concept of the insan al -kham. He uses lots of words. He uses the word like faqir, like qalandar, and mard al walk. And in that he develops this philosophy of the self, where he talks about the self of mard al -Mawin. And he says the purpose of the murder moment is to manifest the best of all qualities. A perfection of human reason, a perfection of human mannerism, a perfection of human virtue, and possession of power, and the power to impact history. That is important. He says, Kudi ko kar bulat itna ke har takdeer se pehle khuda ko bande se puche, bata teri raza. So he's saying, elevate yourself to such extents, to such heights, that God, before he writes your destiny, he confides in you and he asks you, what is the future that you prefer? So by elevating yourself, by becoming a special human being, by becoming this great human being, you become the confidant of God, and then God asks you, what is the future you want? Tell me, I will do that. But this is an important part. So this is an idea that is coming. Now the problem with Iqbal is, Iqbal is borrowing this idea from the concept of Insan al-Kamil of Ibn Arabi, from the Sufi tradition. Why is he rejecting the Sufi tradition? He turns his back. Because he's also influenced by a German philosopher called Nietzsche, who also talks about Superman or Ubermensch. Ubermensch, the superhuman person. Now, what prompted Nietzsche to articulate the idea of the Superman was that he felt that contemporary Christian values, that all contemporary Christian values had become meaningless and irrelevant. And therefore, God was dead, and therefore what human beings needed to do was to evolve themselves and become superhuman. Superhuman, capable of exercising reason independently, capable of having an impact on history. If we didn't master history, we would become slaves of history. And that is where Irbal is borrowing the idea. But where does the idea of Insan al-Kamil come? It comes from the idea of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He is the perfect man. And why is he a perfect man? Now that is a very interesting question as to why is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa an interesting man. Uh, you remember that same ayah that today I have completed for you, your religion. Now, some Sufi scholars have interpreted this ayah to say that when he's talking about Mahatmudinah, he's not talking about religion, but he's talking and referring indirectly to the perfect man, which is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so <coughs> important? I have misplaced my pages and the order in which I wanted to. <laughs> Goes and bear with me for one second, and I will find out. The Prophet, you all know the story of Prophet. Sure. The, the Prophet, you know this, this, this ayah from the Quran, which we <coughs> actually recited in Maghrib. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is saying, Haven't we expanded your chest for you? Haven't we removed the burden from you? But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is purify him in this world. And that particular act of purification raises him to such a level that he becomes more purer than he was when he was born. Which is a very interesting, uh, interesting idea. And the idea is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has different qualities than which we name in the beginning. He is Jabbar, he is Kabir, he is Mahsin, he is Rahim, he is Rahman, he is Hafiz. Now, all of these qualities of Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah seeks to embody in the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to see humanity reflect all his attributes and his qualities. And so now we have this imaginary 
perfect entity that is capable of reflecting God's qualities. The perfect qualities of Allah is our Allah. So in, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does address Prophet Muhammad sometimes with Rauf or Rahim, using his own attributes and saying he is the Prophet who acts with his people as Rauf and Rahim, is in kindness and mercy. And he says that I have sent you as nothing but mercy. So basically he's telling the Prophet Muhammad so I have sent you in this world to manifest my sifa and my zat as Rahman and Rahim on earth. So this idea of insan al is that entity which is in principle, in theory, capable of reflecting all the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the opinion of some Muslim scholars, that when Prophet وسلم, on the day of judgment will achieve the maqam al mahmud he will have become the insan al -khan. He will have become that perfect person, that perfect human being, who is capable of manifesting a little bit of all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes and sifat. And because of the virtue of that maqam al mahmud that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him permission to seek forgiveness on our behalf. So that is when he becomes shafi, because he is able to seek and intercede on our behalf. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the capacity, the opportunity, and the ability to understand the profound nature, the profound quality, and the profound uh, conception of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as this cosmic bridge, as this cosmic bridge between the Creator and the created. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.